I think the, the non-obvious answer is you, you have to focus on teaching the fundamentals through fun games, right? Because you got to have the team who, who maybe can dribble, juggle, right? And you have the team who, who can barely, barely pass a ball or, or dribble the ball. So as you improve technical skills through fun games, they'll start to appreciate, they'll start to understand spacing indirectly, right? So, so the key is, if they're struggling with fundamental skills, then you want to shape your practice. Uh, ball, ball mastery, dribbling sequences, juggling games, like, for example, uh, j- starting, you could gather your whole team around a garbage can or a bucket or a barrel and have them juggle into the, the bucket or barrel with or without a bounce, usually with a bounce, starting with the ball in the hands, and then you finish with 1v1 to cones, and then you could do five minutes of 1v1, and then you switch three times. So they're getting, right, they're getting three different games against three different opponents. If you do this every practice and don't focus on winning games, what's going to happen is you're going to help them um, grow their, their confidence. They're going to be more relaxed on the field, right? Because you, you could argue that the game is just a whole bunch of 1v1 interactions uh, on a fundamental level. But now if you kind of... Right, it's like, what do you got to do? You got to keep the ball, bring it up the field, and finish on goal. So, so, but if these players, they don't, they can't even keep the ball because they can't, they can't dribble, they can't juggle. So to try and teach spacing before, before technical skills, I think is, is, um, before teaching, you, you, you got to, the things that matter the most come before the things that matter the least. So, so you'll, you'll see that as technical skills improve, their on-field awareness will, you could argue, will improve because they'll understand that the ball moves faster than players, right? Because right, most youth games, you see a lot of bumblebee, right? Players ages, I don't know, at least in the States, between five and maybe five, six, seven, eight, Unless they're a gifted team, you're going to see bumble, bumblebee style play, which is like the whole team's chasing the ball and there's like no passing and then maybe one or two players kind of will decide how the game's going to go. So that's where I would start. And I think that's a non-obvious answer. And then once they progress to a point where the whole team can at least juggle, dribble at ease... Then I think what you could transition to is um, a Doug Nevins style practice session, which looks like p- uh, warm up, possession, finishing on goal, crossing and finishing, and then playing to big goals on a small field. Three teams rotating, King of the Hill style, the team sitting out, playing as bumper players on the outside, neutral players, right, with one touch. But that's, you can't execute that practice until the fundamentals are solidified. You know, you gotta help them develop their, their foundation. So, so you gotta run that Tom Turnbull skills and drills, you know, a fun skills and drills training session. Ball mastery, search Cover, C-O-E-R-V-E-R. Uh, it's a, you, you have an app or he's got some YouTube videos. He's been around for ages. Then it's dribbling sequence. Dribbling sequence is, um, Right, you you could do. You could do like outside right, inside right, then that goes into right into your left foot, outside left, inside left, and so so that's one example of a dribbling sequence. You could go. You could go. Outside, outside, inside, outside, inside. That last touch comes across the body, and then you do the same thing with the other foot. And the reason why dribbling sequences sequences are super effective, is because of the rhythmic patterns. They help players not think about dribbling. And why that's important is because, because it, it makes dribbling effortless. They're going to be able to dance around defenders. And it's nice because you don't need cones. It, it's a very effortless way to teach large groups of players with ha- without having to put in effort to create your practice session or if you're limited on 
uh, uh, financial resources. So, you know, some coaches who, who are, you know, grassroots, you know, who have to coach large, large numbers of players with limited resources, you don't need, all you need, each player has a, all they need is a ball at their feet. So you could buy a whole bunch of size one balls, size one ball, you get a, maybe a whole bunch, you know, maybe 10 bucks for a size one ball, which means, you know, 25, you could coach a whole, you could coach a hundred players at a time running that same, that same routine, ball mastery, dribbling sequences, then you go right into the barrel game. Barrel game, it's, it's basically, they say make skills easy, make strength hard. You, you have the players get, encircle, they encircle a garbage can and starting with the ball in the hands, you know, two touches, they go right into the barrel, right? You gotta, sh you gotta create a positive feedback spiral loop, which means you show them what success feels like early because if they start too far away, then they'll get discouraged. If they get discouraged, they're gonna become unmotivated. You gotta teach them how to succeed and how to fail um, effortlessly, right, in, a, in an elegant way. So that's why the barrel game is a great way to help them develop their first touch, timing, balance, rhythm, and coordination. So, and you know, I did this with my middle school team. I did this growing up with Tom Turnbull. It's a super, it's a super fun game because players of different abilities can compete against each other. As players improve, they can start from further and further away. And you don't need to wait, right? One player doesn't need to wait for uh, the other player in order to progress through each body part, right? So you can go right thigh, then left thigh, then both thighs alternating. Then you can go right foot, left foot, both feet alternating, and then finish with any body part you want. The way Tom Turnbull did it, he started with the feet, but you could argue that the thighs are easier to start with because it's a larger surface area, and especially if you're starting from the hands, it just helps players develop, um, I think it's, 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 more, it's easier, it's easier to teach if you start with the thighs, right? Have them step, two steps away from barrel. So you could have like freaking 20 players and they're gonna be bumping into each other. They're gonna start, you know, I'd have, I'd have kids crying, literally crying because they get so frustrated with the drill, but it's, it's, you know, it's a kind of organized chaos and it's a lot of fun. And then you go right into 1v1, you go right into 1v1 and knocking cones over. This, you might have to invest a couple bucks into the cones, tall cones, right? The ones you can knock over. You use one sideline as a, as a, um, you use one sideline to line the cones up and then you, a uh, couple, couple steps away, you line, you create grids, 1v1 cone grids. And players, you know, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, rotate each time and then maybe cool down and that's it. And, and right, no water breaks, but you let players take, get breaks whenever they want, right? They don't even need to ask. So, so the, 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 the practice turns into the fitness. So hopefully this helps. Um, reach out with any questions. All right, thank you.